Knutloy was well known for its horses and uh, horse races. Of course, in those days, you could send the horses by tram or by the Clower Valley Railway. That's when the markets were always the first Wednesday and the middle Wednesday. And one was called the, the Fair Day, and the other was called the Middle Market. And, of course, the soul gathering in those days. Offer by Festival has been going now for something like oh, 12, 13 years. He may try his case all day, but I'll tell you one thing. I would bet you wonder. The horse fair is something that uh, was recreated here in Ochnatloy 10 years ago when the festival commenced first. It's grown from strength to strength over the past number of years. And as you can see today, this is the biggest one ever we had. People from all over Ireland here, there's English people walking about there and there's men from Derry and from the south of Ireland, they're from all over. People at Horse Fair, people that come from all arts and parts to go to it. If it's in your blood, they'll go. If the man says, if it's only a wasted day, they'll go just to be there and get to miss something. They're very greedy people, you know. They're always afraid of missing something. <laughs> That's as good a pony as isn't this people. Clocked them doing 25 mile an hour. No, no mess. The old days, Ballycawley, the next village over was the horse fair. And that time they didn't draw horses and trailers or lorries. There would maybe be 20 big horses. You tied the one to the other's tail and you walked them home, you know. But the horses were all working horses most of them. Now they're riding horses and driving horses. Well, I come from Fentner, the county of Tyrone. And I come here to the horse fair every year. I'd like a good frame to look at, first of all. And the first thing, the frame, then the foot, because I have a fire, and that is my occupation. So, if you haven't got that, you haven't got a good horse. My granddad, he was a horse dealer. He had to be very careful because the horses let them all doped. You know, you could buy a dodgy one. You know, you could have got the needle to keep them quiet. With a local horse dealer who I used to accompany on his round, and selling these horses, that had to be some sort of character and recommendation of the horse. So the man says, George, now what's this horse like in, in harness? He says, you'll be surprised. You'll be pleased when you see him working. I'm rehearsing something I heard my father talking about years and years ago, about the horse fair was held in Carnteel. It was a quiet village and there was if there was a lot of to and fro in the village, the horses were actually dangerous. So in later years, they brought them into the town here and tied them up actually to railings. Certainly, Carnteel goes back a very long way to prehistoric times. This would have been the settlement in the area long before Ochnafloy came into existence and was a burial place for some of the ancient kings or chieftains of the tribes of the O'Neills. It was in these areas then they kept the cattle, the hills would provide the grazing land. But occasionally they would come back to Carnteel at very important times such as uh, fairs and uh, festivals we would really call them. The Shackman Carnteel is a song about a wandering man which was common in Ireland years ago. And he's going to the August Fair in Carnteel. And on the way he, he meets a very fine looking girl and of course he's taken by her. And he boasts about his experiences, and of course this is all to impress. Karen Teal from an early uh, stage was an established place for worship and from that uh, has grown the parish of Karen Teal. It was uh, pretty important during what we know as the 1641 rebellion and during that rebellion the village was attacked and the church here was burned down. This is all happening against the background of the plantation in the 17th century. And at that time, one of the families that had been given uh, an estate of land was the Ridgeways. And they were given and built themselves a seat 
near on the cloy. And in the 18th century, the Moors, they were the local gentry of the time. They took over from the Ridgeways. And under their uh, leadership, Ochnacloy really develops. The Moors came to Ochnacloy about 1670. We're not exactly sure how they got their title, but certainly they were here from that date, if not earlier. It was Atchison Moore who built Ochnacloy. He did the Grand Tour as a young man, and that's probably where he got the idea of such a fine, wide street. He built the parish church in 1736, and uh, many of the three-story houses you can still see on the street uh, date from that period. Um, he also founded a, a, a brewery and a distillery, and he started a new linen market. After he died, uh, he didn't really want his daughters to succeed him. Uh, he had quite an outfall with them. Uh, he, was a, he was a Jacobite, of course, in, in, in politics. And he laid out part of his domain, or part of his farm at Ravella, in the shape of a Scottish thistle. And to this day, you can still see uh, ramparts in the field and ditches that were part of the bulb and the stem uh, and, and the flower. There was an uh, extensive litigation about his will, uh, which impoverished the estate. But in the end, it passed to Nathaniel Montgomery Moore, who began building the new mansion at Garvey House. Well, it has been described as one of the follies of Irish architecture. And it was a Francis Johnson, a very famous architect, that was responsible for it. The original estimate was 16,000 in the year 1770, 1780. And it finished off 70,000. And uh, he actually over spent his budget and he had to go off to the south of France to escape his creditors. It's a very good idea. In Ochnacloy, the two principal landowning families are the Moors of Garvey and the Mutries of Favour Royal. And this is the, the property that the Mutries acquired about 1660 when they came here from Roscobie in Fifeshire. They were the, the largest landowners in the Clocher Valley. Uh, they probably had something like 40 townlands uh, at the height of their power. Well, I did, I believe, have a servant capacity of 80 people. The Faberall House is the only one of its kind in the whole of Ireland. In fact, they find that the, um, the down pipes are certainly not iron, they're stone, lead lined, which means the upkeep was just a bit nil. You'd have less upkeep on the side of that house than you would have in the modern bungalow. <laughs> one of the most interesting members of the family was the Reverend William Moutry, who, uh, of course, didn't get on with his elder brother, uh, who was, of course, the landlord here and, and who lived in the big house. And at one stage, things got so bad that he moved out of the big house and moved into a curious towered cottage at the top of the garden. And this was William Moutry's bachelor retreat for the last 30 or so years of his life, and it was called Cherry Hill. William Moutry's diaries are, are a great social record as well as being a family, uh, a family record. Now, for example, in June 1850, he talks about the Arman Enniskillen coach ran past the gate here for the first time, a quarter before one from Enniskillen. And of course, the stage coaching was another aspect of, of horses in Ochnacloy. This was the main road front drive up to Garvey. And your, your coach road came across here from the Ocher side, and this was up by Ochnacloy on the main Enniskillen. Dublin Road, and you see the pillars and the mounting stones where they used to get on their horses or onto their carriages. And uh, back up the lane there, there was a turning circle where the coaches used to turn. The military, of course, would have brought the, the horses to Ochnacloy in large numbers, and Ochnacloy was always a garrison town. In the Barnet Yard, there was stabling here for about 50 horses. You had the Tipperary Regiment, you had the North Yorkshire Regiment, uh, you had a regiment known as the Dirty Half Hundred, who were here actually uh, shortly after Waterloo. Ochnacloy continued to prosper in the 19th century, and in fact, it had one of the first uh, private banks in, in Ireland. In 1804, James Falls opened a bank in the town. 
However, the most uh, enterprising personality uh, or merchant was James Fiddis, who arrived here as a young apprentice uh, in 1818. Now, he went on to become an important man, developing uh, a grocery business, hardware. Uh, he was a woolen draper. He also had the Mineral Water Company in Ochnacloy. He was in charge of the markets. Now my poor outer houses are worn and so thin. The war parts coming out now that you'd have been in. So I took a notion as the autumn leaves fall that I'd hit the net lie and I'd look round the stall. Rally long, rally that I'd hit Ballard, the and I'd That's It'll stretch like a woman's tongue. Conscience. Conscience. P50, if you want. 1931, I came here first with uh, John Shearer, Smithfield. I worked for him. Started me in this. Uh, done me a great turn. Uh, 31. We sold gramophone records then and rope. That was, the, that was the job then. We had it in coils and rolls and opened it up and measured it out, showed them the man, took somebody to take it up the, up the town and back again. Somebody would say, where will it take it? Take it away on past the workhouse. Not belong to you and me's in it. That was a bit of a family. Everybody and... brought their wares of all sorts and there was anything from turkeys and fowl and, and cattle, horses, pigs. Pigs was a big going off inside one time too. Farmers brought in their farm produce and the farmer's wife brought in eggs and butter and sold them on the street. I remembered uh, a lot of cattle on the street, pigs, all sorts of animals, and a big crowds of people. Very terrible big, it was a great market town of Hunnitley, the best of thick in Toro. The cattle at the time, they were sold uh, up at the top of the town, as they call it, up on the Pound Hill, and uh, they were put into the yard. And uh, that time, the most of them was taken by lorry, and some of them went, was taken down to the Clare Valley, and wherever they were going to... Well, Ochnacloy was the headquarters of the Clare Valley Railway Company, uh, the narrow gauge light railway, which opened in 1887 and which served the valley for 53 years uh, until it closed uh, during the Second World War. Now, uh, we had uh, an important locomotive shed at Ochnacloy where the engines were maintained and in, in some cases even rebuilt. So the, the, the main works in connection with the railway were here at Ochnacloy. I started work at the Clough Valley Railway in 1925 to serve my time as a fitter and toner. It was about 50 around 50, 45 or 50. I was working there, there was a blacksmith, there was a, the wood, the carpenters, and the boiler makers, the carriage men that worked and kept the carriages and repaired for the passengers. The carriages would be made in England like, new carriages, and they were left in for repairs in the works. Generally, whenever the first ones came in, the apprentices who came in, there was all sorts of tricks played on them. It's going fine out of somebody to land you around square. And, and some about striped paint and all that sort of thing. All sorts of tricks was carried on on them for a certain time, like for a year or so till they got settled in. From Maguire's Bridge to Tynham was a, a run of the line. <laughs> and it passed through Brookborough, Five Mill Town, Clare, Acher, Ballygally. Oh, McLeod, Kelleton, to Tainan. It uh, connected with the Great Northern at Tainan and uh, right through to Maguire's Bridge. Sometimes it took into the fields and came out again on the roadside. There was a gate house there, as they called it, and there was somebody there that worked on the railway. <laughs> and whenever they heard the whistle of the train coming, they looked that the road was clear on the white flag and a red flag, and if there was anything on the road, they'd uh, the, give them the red flag and they slowed down. Well, there was horse racing down in Ravalla, right? There was horse racing out the Kelleton Road, and there was also horse racing on the football field in this town. 
Frank Kernan raced ponies in them times, the famous Frank Kernan from Cross Midland. I used to ride ponies for him. They ascended Knocking Cloy, you see, coming two and three days prior to the race. Because they had to travel by rail. And those days, the only mode of transport to them. So they came here, and of course the town was alive for, for days, you know. The flapping at that time was, um, it was just pony racing or horse racing, but there was no rules attached to it, you know. Not like, you know, like the horse racing today, like it's all, you know, under the rules or licensed, whatever you call it. The entry fee was 10 shillings. And your price was 25 and 30 pounds, that sort of thing. And there were four races. And then they had another race then, the Constellation race, that any, any horses that hadn't won a race, they re-entered for the last race then, the Constellation race. There's a lot of changes in this town now. A lot of shops has changed hands, of course, you know. We used to have, you've heard tell of, I'm sure Sawyer's is up there. And Phyllis Simpson's, they used to make minerals and bottle stout and all, you've heard of them. There's a hotel up at the corner then, and Campbell, a man called Campbell had it. Campbell's Hotel, it was a commercial hotel. Travellers stayed in it overnight. Travellers also came down on buses, you see, or probably in the Clover Valley. Tommy McCann, oh, Tommy's there for a late time. It is, surely. My family go back now to the very early 1900s. It was just an open shop in those days. There were no glass, no door. It was just a mesh that was sat on the night, you know. So meat was hung outside on the, on the, on a rail outside in front of the store, you see. And it was sold more or less, more or less by lump type of thing, you know. Now that was the days now when they, we killed our own cattle. I came here in 1934. That wasn't yesterday. In the beginning, you see, they were very suspicious of me. And I, I, don't, I didn't think, they, I think they thought I wasn't quite real, you see. So sometimes they would say, um, are you the new chemist? Are you qualified? And I actually hadn't done anything very much with animals, and I was always afraid something would happen to the animal. I couldn't believe my own eyes, the big doses they got. And you might have to make up 12 powders with jalap and rhubarb and and maybe a wee bit of horse has got a wee bit of salt peter always. But anyhow, this, this old doll came up to the counter and there were quite a few people in, and she said to me, um, she wanted something for the, the, uh, the bachelor. And I, I went away around and I thought, goodness, I wonder what that is. I knew all the people who were watching me to see how I was going to get on or how I was going to get out of this one, for some of them would know what I didn't know, you see. So I we went back again and I said to her, uh, I beg your pardon, is it your husband you want this stuff for? Oh, not at all, she says. It's the bull, the bull, she says. <laughs> Just down here, McCready's. McCready's, that's correct, Scotch Mill. It used to employ a lot of people too. I Scotch flax in the mill. You got about 26 shillings or so per stone, or according to your grade, you got a shilling or two more. Whatever grade they said it would be worth, you know. And they lifted the rate of this flax and they done that with it. See, was it hard, good, strong rate? And the better the rate was, the better price you got. <laughs> it was only a winter job. But in war times, it was between scotch and tow and flax, it was a a, sail, a full round the clock job for a few years during the war, and only then. During the war, particularly, we were very, very well placed because just on the other side of the border there was a wee shop, and you could walk into this shop and you could bring back legitimately so much bacon, so much cooked ham, so much sugar, so much tea. I was always on the lookout for chocolate. <laughs> Chloe is noted for smuggling as we're so close to each other and we have nothing that divides us only the black water the river and it was and it was very convenient to have a cow or a bullock or a, a or a herd at one side and they could finish up in the north at night that time the the road buses came on the road and uh, they couldn't compete with them because the, the road buses le collected the people along the roadside. They lost the passenger thing. The Clover Valley was supposed to 
end in uh, 1941, on the last day in 41. And uh, that evening, the lads in the shop, they decided to have the last run on the coach. And we went up to Five Mile Turn. And I did not tell you what we done, but we, we, we fooled about a bit in Five Mile Turn and we didn't get back to 42. And that's why it was to run into 42. Well, during the war, the war, there was very few stalls. But then after the war, everything started to come out again, you know. Got back to normal, you know. There's big changes in a sense. Used to be the horse fair and the cattle and all on the street here, and the pigs, everything. But that's all changed now, you know. It's the market now, you know. My country was a notorious lady of this village. There was a painter who was painting the name on outside the sign. He put up Thompson first. So he started off with Margaret. It was Margaret, you called her. So he started off and he made an M and an A. And somebody took him off the letter and went into the pub. And they got drunk, so Ma remained there to the day she died. Come all you young fellas who money to spend And listen to me for a while Now I'll tell you a story that happened to me And I hope that it won't make you smile For I'd been a boozer quite fond of my pint And I lowered it down jar by jar Till I met disaster while drinking one night in the pub that called my Thompson's bar. You're going to be on TV. Keep memories of Porter's are Clary and Harley and all this walking after the horse. In fact, I heard it quite a bit myself in the horses. But the earliest tractors coming quite a few was in 1940, 42, the beginning, beginning of the war when there was compulsory tillage and all this land had to be ploughed. And that was actually how I remember them, and this seemed to increase every year on from that. It's uh, Ferguson Brown, 1938, and it was last taxed in 1961. The uh, problem with this tractor is it's basically 75% aluminium, and uh, it was uh, aluminium that was manufactured pre-war, and it isn't very good quality, and then it, it rots. The uh, radiator is another problem. There's 122 tubes in it. And uh, when I restored this tractor in 73, 74, there was none of the reproduction tubes available. You can buy them now, and they're 22 pounds each. This is a Ford Ferguson tractor. It was made by Ford, and the hydraulic end of it was designed by Harry Ferguson. And Harry F Ferguson was having problems with his people who were building tractors in England, David Brown namely, and he went to Fords of America and he got talking to old Henry Ford one day and they had a handshake agreement and this is the development of the handshake agreement. You have the engine fixed up and it's now just a matter of building it up and getting it right painted.